a bit of an underwhelming weekend for the Indiana Hoosiers men's basketball team as Illinois comes in and makes a bit of a statement in Assembly Hall on Saturday. We'll recap that game, where things went wrong for the Hoosiers. Uh, the women's basketball team, though, continues riding high without Mackenzie Holmes as they down Purdue on Sunday. Also get you caught up everything on that game on today's episode. <laughs> Locked on Hoosiers, your daily podcast on the Indiana Hoosiers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, Hoosiers? It is Monday, February 7th. This is Locked on Hoosiers, your one and only daily one-stop shop, really, for everything IU Athletics, whether it's news, whether it's analysis, whether it's previews or, as we're going to do multiple times today, recaps on games played. I'm your host, as always, Jacob Rude. I want to thank you guys for making us part of your day today uh, and for making Locked on Hoosiers your first listen every day. Uh, just a reminder, we're free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. We premiere the episodes every morning at 7 a.m. over there. You can join in with fellow Hoosiers and listen, on, listen watch along whatever you choose kind of during your morning routine. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online had you covered this season with more props, odds and lines than ever before. Bet Online where the game starts. As I mentioned, we have a couple of recaps to do today. Uh one not so positive and one positive. Men's team uh put on a good showing for half of the game against Illinois on Saturday and then realized why Illinois is one of the best teams in the Big Ten. Uh, women's basketball team uh, did not have nearly as much issue with Purdue this time as they did in the away game earlier this season. We'll recap both of those here in a few moments. As always, though, you can subscribe to Locked on Hoosiers wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Hoosiers. Let's jump into that men's game first. Uh, for those that missed it, quick little recap. Illinois wins 74 to 57. Uh, not a tale of the whole game. Hoosiers really uh, played well in the first half. We're leading at halftime 36 to 34. Uh, they really absorbed more foul trouble from Chase Jackson Davis, uh, limited to some extent. Kofi Coburn, although it was a bit of an accumulation uh, and a war of attrition as the IU just kind of ran out of bigs to put on him. Uh, he was drawing fouls. He wasn't necessarily putting up points or anything in the first half. Uh, weathered uh, the storm a bit. It seemed like they could be on the better side of things. Illinois shot 9-22 in the first half, only made four three-pointers, but... Um, Trace Jackson Davis, as we said, battled foul trouble. When he wasn't doing that, he never really got into a rhythm. And that's exactly what Illinois did get into into the second half. They went 14 of 26 from the field, hit six of their 13 three pointers, and blew the game wide open. Outscored Indiana 40 to 21. Uh, it was not close at all in that second half. Uh, they took the fans right out of it. And I'll touch on this a bit. I don't think this was necessarily a reality check or or anything of that nature, but um, IU is a tough place to play at. I mean, ask Purdue. All jokes aside, ask Purdue, ask all the Big Ten teams that have come into uh, Assembly Hall. Um, aside from Michigan, Indiana had handled every one of them, and Michigan's the only home game they'd lost, period. So there is a home court advantage, uh, and that's why I think – this may not have been a reality check, but it was a statement victory in a way for Illinois because they did something that very few Big Ten teams have been able to do this season uh, and just take the fans completely out of it. And when you consider the first half they had uh, and then what they were able to do in the second half, uh, in some ways it, it might have been more impressive than that Michigan game because uh, they absorbed everything the fans had to throw at them were behind the eight ball, adjusted, and ran IU off the court, honestly, by the end of that game. Um, Kofi Coburn, incredible. 
in that second half, 17 points, eight rebounds in total. Trent Frazier uh, was unstoppable, really. 23 points, three of six from the uh, three-point line, eight of 11 overall. Alfonso Plummer has been one of their best players on the season. He only went three of 10 from the field, uh, got to the free throw line a fair amount and finished with 14 points. But um, it was a team effort in that second half. Illinois made 10 of their 23 threes on the day. Uh, When IU typically loses, it's because they give up uh, three pointers. We've seen throughout the season, the Penn state game, the Michigan game and the Illinois game this time around. Like I said, I don't, I saw some phrasing and I'm not going to, I'm not trying to point fingers or anything, but I saw lots of people say this is a reality check. Uh, This is kind of maybe unacceptable in a way. And I want to make sure that we're kind of keeping expectations adjusted in the right way, set at the right level. This is a really, really good Illinois team. This is a an Illinois team that uh, I believe is still atop the Big Ten, um, and one that is they are they are ten and two in the Big Ten. Uh, both Purdue and Wisconsin are nine and three, and they had just beaten Wisconsin. They'll face Purdue tomorrow, I believe, on Tuesday. Um, this is a really good Illinois team. The Arguably the best. I think they are the best team in the Big Ten. I that I don't think it is bad that IU lost to them. Sure, that second half, um, the process wasn't great, and there's things we'll talk about today and tomorrow um, overall that they can try to adjust. But um, I, I want to make sure that we're kind of we have expectations set right. I, I don't think Indiana had any ideas of kind of necessarily being the best team in the Big Ten, and they hadn't looked anything like it. Um, so I, I I don't want to kind of put a, a hard cap on what this team can be because I still think they can be really good. But I also want to make sure that we're not setting unrealistic expectations. I expect to compete with every team at home at the very least, uh, especially the best teams in the Big Ten. And I expect to, uh, on pretty much every night, compete on the road as well. Uh, I would want to win every home game, sure, but losing to Illinois um, I don't think is a huge step back. It's not kind of one step forward, one step back, anything like that. Uh, Illinois didn't kind of show any weaknesses that we didn't already know that were there, especially if Trey Jackson Davis is going to get in foul trouble. Uh, Rob Finnessy wasn't there this time to explode for 20 points and make up that deficit because if he is, if he has a 20-point night out of nowhere – I mean, it was a 17 point game. You're right back in that game. So um, I, I don't I don't think this was a, a, a huge setback loss. Um, there's things you can learn. And again, I, I don't want to put a hard cap on what the um, team can be. And I expect them to compete. And maybe that I mean, that's a fair criticism. The, the team I didn't think competed very well in that second half. Um, they were really getting torn apart on the defensive end, which is not a characteristic of this team, and couldn't really find anything go, couldn't get anything going, I should say, on the offensive end. It's been an issue all season. Neither of those, or especially, I should say, the offensive side, that's not a new issue this season. Uh, the defense, you might expect a little bit more out of, but uh, Illinois, when you have Kofi Coburn, when IU has both Trace and Michael Dern in foul trouble because of him you're kind of having to search for answers that aren't there. They aren't there. So uh, the Hoosiers were stretched thin. Um, They're, they were forced to kind of adapt on the fly. It worked in the first half, didn't work in the second half. Um, So I, I, the good thing is Indiana's responded well after losses all season long. Um, Every time they've lost, they've immediately won the next game. So they'll get a chance to go to Northwestern tomorrow to, um, continue that trend, but uh, I, I want to make sure that we're not getting ex- expectations too high yet. I know we're all kind of riding high after how well the Hoosiers did play. I know I said that I I thought they might have turned a corner of those Penn State and Maryland games, but as we talked with Dustin DePierak, uh last week, and again, the episode you guys should all listen to, um, there's going to be highs and lows in the Big Ten season, and Hoosiers were riding high a bit after those Penn State and Maryland wins right back down to a low. And that's just kind of the nature of Big Ten play. So uh, we're going to talk about some of the players, some of the reasons the Hoosiers fell on uh, Saturday here in just a moment. 
before we do that, we mentioned today's sponsor of the show is Bet Online, and they have you guys covered with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. As football continues its march through the playoffs, right to the big game uh, in a couple days at this point, under a week. BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. It's not just football either. Uh, BetOnline has uh, up-to-the-minute info on pro and college hoops, NHL, boxing, UFC, uh, along with live real-time updates of current games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers available for the 2022 season. BetOnline, where the game starts. It's Super Week brought to you by Get Upside, and there's no better place to get coverage of the big game than the Locked On NFL podcast. Locked On Bengals and Locked On Rams are in LA. I know other podcasts are as well. Uh, they'll be there all week to cover the big game, so make sure you guys are checking out all the NFL coverage over there. We're going to highlight a couple key players and uh, kind of talk bigger picture on some of these. Start with Xavier Johnson, who I know we talked about going to reference that ep episode with Dustin DePirac last Thursday. It's a really good episode. I want you guys to, to go listen to it. But we talked about a lot of things in that episode. And one of them we talked about was just kind of the, the maturation maybe of this team and Xavier Johnson. I know it started rough. Probably the low point was that Notre Dame game when he was getting booed. I made my feelings known then. Don't ever boo players. And Mike Woodson made his feelings known. He has absolutely turned it around. And... He was a leader on Saturday, I thought, especially with Trace out. He was creating so much on the offensive end, getting to the paint, uh, whether it was finishing, whether a lot of really nice assists, a couple really pretty passes. Um, once they kind of maybe drew Kofi Coburn, um, it was interesting seeing how the Hoosiers approached uh, the offensive side of the ball because there's a lot of ball screens and when you have a player like Kofi Coburn, you're going to play a really deep drop coverage, which means he's not coming out of the paint, um, which allows you a runway to get to the rim. But that's kind of what they want you to do because they think Kofi is going to be able to block shots at the rim more than you're going to be able to finish him. So the natural kind of way to attack that is in the mid range. We saw Tamar Bates uh, attempt a couple mid range jumpers, Trey Galloway. Knocked down at least one floater, maybe maybe two floaters, um, kind of off that uh, that that mid range area is just wide open. Uh, and when at times this season we've seen Xavier Johnson see that space, and I think of that Wisconsin game where he was able to beat his defender, and then things got kind of haywire after that. And uh, I think on Saturday was kind of a good example of how he's started to integrate with this team, kind of learn uh, the players on this team, learn what Mike Woodson wants out of a point guard. He finishes with 12 points, five rebounds, five assists. Uh, I don't think that fully encapsulates his game uh, overall. As I said, he was, a re he was a leader. He was the linchpin for IU offensively in that first half. Uh, it, wasn't, it was never really a pretty uh, offensive showing. That first half, they sh IU shot just 41%. Uh, overall, uh, they shot 29% in the second half, though. But uh, Xavier Johnson so integral to this team. And we've said it time and time again. I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse to a certain extent, but uh, it's really impressive how far he's come this season um, from the beginning of the season where it seemed like the guards were a liability to uh, by the beginning of February where he's one of the strengths of this team now. Uh, especially on the defensive side of the ball as well. He creates so much havoc at the point of attack and um, is able to really disrupt offenses um, on that side of the ball and is a maybe an underrated reason why the IU defense is as good as it is typically. Trace had a pretty quiet game by really any standard. He only finished with six points, uh, six rebounds, he had three fouls and three turnovers. He was three and nine from the field. Um, he first half was in foul trouble really quickly, reminiscent of that Purdue game. Sat on the bench the entire first half because IU was able to stay ahead for almost that entire first half. He comes back in and predictably didn't have much of a rhythm going. Uh, and he's going up against possibly the hardest matchup for him all season. 
barring somebody in the NCAA tournament potentially. Uh, so I thought he forced things at times. Uh, there were moments where it seemed like he would, in normal situations, just kind of physically overwhelm someone. And when you're facing Kofi Coburn, you don't ever physically overwhelm him. So he never really got into a rhythm offensively. Um, everything looked a little bit forced and just unnatural. And I, it's a small sample size, but it it might be a little concerning that the two times he's kind of faced the best big men in the Big, big Ten, whether it's Zach Eady or Kofi Coburn, he's immediately gotten into foul trouble in both games. Um, I'm sure that is part of the game plan for both of those teams, Purdue and Illinois, is attack trace and get him into foul trouble uh, because that changes everything IU does on both ends of the court. Uh, so in that sense, part of it's unavoidable, but it is concerning that the two biggest games of the year in Big Ten play, uh, he was saddled to the bench for big chunks of them because he got into foul trouble. Uh, I'm not sure how much of that, again, I don't. It's hard to say how much of that trace can really stop. I mean, you want him to defend the rim and be aggressive. You don't want him just conceding buckets just to be able to be on the floor. Uh, so I, I'm sure it's something that Coach Woodson and the coaching staff as a whole are talking about uh, with him. But Kofi Coburn 100% outplayed him without question. Uh, Kofi Coburn's also really good and one of the Big Tim Player of the Year front runners, I would say, at this point in the season. Um, him, Trace is up there, Johnny Davis, obviously. Uh, a lot of guys, a lot of talented players um, in that list. And Trace has struggled against him. So uh, it's something he's going to have to adapt. Uh, I don't believe that was the only time the uh, Hoosiers play Illinois. So he's not going to face him again until. Uh, Big Ten tournament potentially, but he does have Zach Eady in the final game of the year. So uh, we will see if he's able to adjust in that regard in the future. Last player to talk about, again, this is partially beating a dead horse, but Miller Cop on the day, he only played 16 minutes, no points, uh, no field goals, no three-pointers, no free throws, two rebounds, a couple of fouls, an assist, a turnover, and a steal. Miller Cop's value is on offense and shooting the ball and spacing the floor. I don't think you can get by with him just simply not scoring uh, on offense. And part of this, I think, is a continued question about the starting lineup and whether this is the right group. Um, Trey Galloway is simply just playing more minutes than Miller Cop on a regular basis anyway. Uh, so. I, maybe it doesn't matter as much if Trey's playing, but we've seen this team dig holes repeatedly on the offensive or at the start of games, I should say. The starting five will dig holes at the beginning of the game, and then you're forced to play from behind. You don't want that. So uh, Mike Woodson had said in the past he's not going to change the starting lineup unless it continues to be a problem. Uh, it wasn't a problem in the Penn State and Maryland games necessarily, although they fell behind early to Maryland. Uh, they really quickly made that up. Um, It'll be interesting to see. I, I I would be surprised if there's an adjustment, but Trey Galloway is one of the five best players on this team right now. Um, one of the issues may be trying to find minutes for Miller Cop when you uh, are bringing him off the bench because you have Jordan Geronimo, you have Michael Durr potentially, you have Miller Cop. Um, it's it's tough to find minutes for that many forwards, but if the goal is to start the five best players, I think Trey Galloway is in that list. Uh, and Miller Cop continues to struggle. So we'll see if any changes are coming. I don't want to linger on that too much because we've spoken a lot about the starting lineup, and I think it speaks for itself uh, a lot. But, uh, I mean, I certainly want this team to succeed. I don't want to intentionally point out bad performances. But if if Miller Cop is unable to score, if you're unable to create looks for him, his value is greatly diminished to what he can bring to a starting lineup. and really any minutes he's able to play. If he can't, if he isn't getting shots up, uh, he's going to really struggle to be a productive player out there. So be interesting to see if Mike Woodson makes any changes when the Hoosiers travel to Northwestern tomorrow. The good news for IU Athletics over the weekend is the women's basketball team picked up a win over Purdue. Was it nearly as dramatic as the last game was? We will recap that 
where the Hoosiers stand uh, after that game. And a, a little bit of an update, it seems, on when Mackenzie Holmes might be back this season. It's a new year, so that means New Year's resolutions. Uh, Built Bar has it uh, for you guys. If your resolution is about getting healthy, eating healthy, Built Bar is the place to go. Um, have you guys tried the new puffs that they have as well? We talk a lot about them. We don't talk a lot about the puffs. If you haven't, you're missing out on one of the Built Bar's best tasting bars. Uh, my favorite thing about them is the uh, variety of flavors they have to choose from, whether it's coconut almond, whether it's uh, raspberry, whether it's mint brownie. New for this month is white chocolate cookies and cream. I may have to try that one out because I'm a huge cookies and cream fan. Uh, they're all delicious. They're all new flavors coming out all the time, limited time flavors. Best part is they're healthy for you. Most Built Bars contain... 130 calories, 4, to, 4 grams of sugar, 4 grams of net carbs, 17 grams of protein. You can compare that to whatever candy bar you want, and it's going to be better for you. Uh, so make sure you guys go to Built.com. Um, check out what they have available, all the flavors they have to offer. Use the promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Women's basketball team on uh, Sunday came away with a 64-57 to win over Purdue. Last time these two teams met, Indiana needed a miracle from Grace Berger to uh, pull that game out, force overtime, win the game in overtime in Mackey Arena. This time around, uh, 7,891 fans in attendance, most fans for a game this season, fifth most ever for an IU women's basketball game. Shout out to everybody that was there. Uh, they were the driving force in a lot of ways behind the Hoosiers uh, winning this one. That was a flattering scoreline for Purdue. Indiana had a 19-point second-half lead. Purdue had a bit of a run to close the third quarter. Uh, Indiana built the lead up a bit again. Purdue went on a, another run in the fourth quarter, had the lead down to as little as five points. Uh, Nicole Cardano Hillary made a, a big defensive play late. Uh, her and Grace Berger uh, closed out the game at the free throw line for the Hoosiers to hang on for this one. Um, they are now 16 and three overall, eight and one in Big Ten play. It was Nicole Cardano Hillary that had the big night, 19 points, seven rebounds. She did have seven turnovers. A lot of those were late in the game when Purdue was making their run, but Overall, a huge uh, night from her. It's different Hoosiers stepping up uh, seemingly on a game-by-game -game basis as they uh, kind of endure life without McKenzie Holmes. Uh, Grace Berger, as we mentioned, was big on the night. 17 points, 6 rebounds, 5 assists. Uh, Ghoul Bay was the one that uh, stepped up big in Mackey. Purdue's game plan was very clearly to not let her do that. She was only 4 of 13 on the night. 11 points and six rebounds. Uh, the Hoosiers are typically a team that absolutely lives in the paint, and they only had 22 points in the paint of their 64 on uh, on Sunday. They got outscored by Purdue in the paint. Uh, it was uh, other ways that the Hoosiers were able to come away with the victory. They were only four of 11 from the three-point line, so a lot of mid-range scoring on the day. Um, Keandra Brown... Uh, Played only 10 minutes, uh, but she had four points and four rebounds. She started, continued to start for McKenzie Holmes, but she only played 10 minutes because Chloe Moore McNeil had a career game off the bench. 11 points and 10 rebounds, uh, had a steal as well, was four of seven from the field, two of four from three. Uh, if you're looking at maybe the couple of people that have stepped up most in McKenzie Holmes's absence, we mentioned Ghoul Bay. Uh, she had a career night against Minnesota, I believe, last week. Moore McNeil had her career night today. Those two have been huge for the Hoosiers. Uh, Grace Wagner had a huge game against Minnesota as well. She played seven minutes uh, on Sunday. Uh, another player who kind of impacts the game in ways that aren't necessarily found on the scoreboard, but 
uh, or on the box score, I should say, but uh, big performance from Chloe Moore McNeil as she helped the Hoosiers to another win over Purdue. Terry Morin is 12 and three against Purdue now, I believe is her record. Uh, Indiana is dominating this series against Purdue uh, as of late. It is their uh, seventh straight win over Purdue. They have won 11 of the last 12. Uh, just dominance from them in this series, um, which is always a great thing, always a fun thing. Um, we mentioned Chloe Moore McNeil, Grace Wagner. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of role those two have uh, as well as Keandra Brown when Mackenzie Holmes returns. Because all season long we've talked about the Hoosiers not having much of a bench and how much that kind of hurts them at times. Uh, if you're looking for silver linings, there's always there's never a net positive for a player getting hurt. And the Hoosiers would very much, obviously, rather have Mackenzie Holmes than not have her right now. But if you're looking for silver linings, it's that you've seen Keandra Brown step up. You've seen Chloe Moore McNeil step up. You've seen Grace Wagner step up. Um, Coach Morin is always going to, uh, she said, kind of lean on experience, but you've gotten those three to provide you really big minutes. Caitlin Peterson has played a little bit uh, as well over the last handful of games. You've gotten some players to get some experience they wouldn't have otherwise gotten. We'll see how that factors into... Um, the Big Ten tournament, NCAA tournament, when McKenzie Holmes should be back. A couple different places. Um, there's still no exact timetable. It's all just kind of hearsay, people talking to people, what you hear on the broadcast. It sounds like the best case scenario is McKenzie Holmes will be back for the regular season finale, which is against Maryland um, at the end of February. She's taking part in shoot around to some degree. Doesn't seem like they have a real firm timetable on her return, but uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how soon she's able to get back because quicker she can get back and healthy, uh, health is obviously going to be the biggest thing, but the quicker she can get back, um, the quicker she can get back into a rhythm and help the Hoosiers uh, in the Big Ten tournament and the NCAA tournament where they're going to have Really big goals, really big expectations. There was a game rescheduled um, for the Hoosiers February 12th, Saturday, this upcoming Saturday. They will host Michigan State. Game rescheduled from January 19th. Uh, they That is the only rescheduled game so far for the Hoosiers. We will see. Uh, they, I believe, have three more games potentially to be rescheduled. And the season ends on February 25th. So that's 19 days. They already have six games left. So you're looking at potentially nine games in 19 days. I don't know that that's going to happen, but we will certainly see how the Big Ten plans on rescheduling some of these contests uh, moving forward. But big win for the Hoosiers. Any win over Purdue is a great win. Uh, we will be back tomorrow to talk about uh, a preview for the Northwestern game for the men's team uh, in tomorrow's episode. But thanks again, guys, for making Locked on Hoosiers your first listen every day. Now, for your second listen, head on over to the Locked on Bets podcast, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs, hosted by your boy Q, with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. Appreciate all the love you guys continue to give us uh, day in and day out. Uh, truly, it means a lot to me. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Leave a quick rating. Uh, it, that helps us out a ton. Most importantly, though, guys, have a 